Well, good morning and welcome everyone. This is James Orr, and thank you for joining me today for another episode of Real Estate Investor Storytime. Uh, we've been going over a bunch of different stories. In fact, uh, up until last week, we kind of did a different person each time. We kind of went over a whole bunch of different uh, story variations. Last week, we met Peter, who is a real estate investor from Denver, and we went over kind of his situation and what's going on. And today, we're going to continue with Peter's story, because I don't think Peter was quite done. And so we'll find out some really interesting things about Peter this morning. Uh, for those of you that are kind of just coming on, you are welcome to use the chat window if you have questions for me or want to ask for some clarification on something or I say something that doesn't make sense to you. These are live. Uh, but I will continue telling Peter's story. And so a little bit about Peter, if you remember from before. So uh, last week, we talked about Peter. He lives in Denver. Let me actually pull up some, some of the reminders that by Peter. So uh, Peter lives in Denver. He's a young real estate investor. He's starting with $25,000 in savings, which actually isn't enough to buy their first property. Doesn't have enough for a down payment. Uh, he has a good job, making about $72,000 per year. He currently rents a property for about $2,200 per month. And if you remember from last week, I went over in detail the properties that he was buying. I'm not going to do that today. Um, because I think I covered it already in the previous week's stuff. And so if you want to go watch that, I don't want to spend the time doing it a second time uh, when I want to cover new things today. But if you go watch last week's episode, it's posted on the website, uh, you can go ahead, it's realestatefinancialplanner.com for those of you that don't know. But if you go on the website, you can watch the previous episode from Peter and learn about the exact details of the properties that he's considering buying. But the $2,200 a month in rent that he's paying is based on the types of properties that he's buying. So he's renting a property that he would otherwise consider buying. So he's paying $2,200 in rent. Um, he, last week we determined which one of the three options he should do. Should he save up 20% down payments and buy rental property that way? Should he save up 25% down in order to buy rental properties? Or should he do this crazy nomad thing, only have to save up 5% down, but it requires that he move into the property, live there for a year before converting it to a rental. So he could save up one fourth, if he's thinking about 20% down versus 5% down, one fourth of the down payment that he needs in order to do it actually gets a better interest rate because it's owner occupant instead of an investor, but he has to live there for a year in order to be in compliance and not commit loan fraud, which you don't wanna do, you go to jail for that. So you wanna actually go and, live in the property for a year and do that. And then once you're done living there for a year, then you convert it to a rental. You keep it. You don't have to refinance or anything. You just keep the same financing in place. You buy your next property, move in with 5% down, and then you acquire rental properties that way. And last week, I'll kind of spoil it for you a little bit and tell you that Nomad was the best. Okay. And we're going to go over some details about that probably in some future episodes with uh, Peter. But today I'm going back to the 20% down thing because Peter's like, you know, if I don't have to move into these properties, if I don't have to move 10 times in order to acquire 10 rental properties with 5% down each, I'd rather not. And so today we're going to talk about Peter putting 20% down, saving up, putting 20% down and buying properties. But I've added a couple new twists to Peter today. The new twists are, last week, Peter was earning a fixed 8% per year in the stock market. Every single month, he earned one twelfth of 8%. It's actually a little bit different because we do take into account compounding and we do 8% for the year, but it's about 8% for the year. And so we assumed he earned that every single year. Now, what do you think? Do you think that the stock market is going to return a guaranteed fixed 8% return every single year, month in, month out? No, of course not. And that was part of the problem, right? That's part of the problem with how we analyze all of these assumptions when we analyze investment properties. You know, when we were using Brian's amazing, you know, the world's greatest real estate deal analysis spreadsheet, Brian's spreadsheet, which you guys can download at realestatefinancialplanner.com forward slash spreadsheet. But when we analyze deals in that, that's part of the problem with the spreadsheet is it doesn't take into account that, you know, there are going to be years when the stock market and real estate prices and rents don't go up by an exact amount. 
It's not like when we buy a property, rents always go up by 1%, 2%, 3% a year, or that we get you know, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 percent in the stock market, or whatever we think we're going to get every single time. And so, whenever we do modeling, whenever we think about, you know, retiring or achieving financial independence, and we think to ourselves, okay, if I save this amount per year and I earn whatever it is, eight percent per year in the stock market, then I'm going to be able to achieve financial independence and retire by the age of, insert your number here, 52, 43, 31, whatever it happens to be. The fact is, that's not reality. <laughs> It's not true. And so today, we're going to add some variability in the returns Peter is getting. It's not 8% fixed anymore in the stock market. It's not 2% per year appreciation rate on the real estate. It's not 2% per year rent increases anymore. And in case you're wondering, interest rates will not remain at all-time lows forever. And if it takes Peter... 10, 20 years, because it was taking him a while to acquire, you know, saving up uh, to, to get 20% down payments or 25% down payment on properties. It takes a long time to save up that when you're only saving. I think Peter's saving $1,000 a month, which is still amazing, right? To be able to put away $1,000 a month in savings, that's awesome. However, it still takes a long time when you're trying to buy $400,000 properties to save up 20%. That's like 80 grand. So now... Peter is going to take whatever it takes in order to do that, in order to find those things. So I'm going to go over and I'm going to show you, I'm going to build out this kind of like mental construct for you and explain to you what Peter is thinking. Because imagine for a minute, Peter is trying to buy properties, but the interest rates do remain low for a while. Well, that makes it easier for him to buy, which is what we modeled last week. We modeled the interest rates staying very low. We also modeled appreciation remaining fixed and rent appreciation, the, you know, the, the property values and the rents going up over time. We, we made all those fixed as we did the stock market. Today, not true. But if the market goes in his favor, you know, if it, it actually remains low for interest rates, as an example, or the properties don't appreciate that much while he's waiting to acquire them, but then as soon as he acquires them, they go bananas and start appreciating like crazy. You know, if the, if the market goes in his favor, yeah, it's going to help him. It's like, you know, the rising tide lifts all ships sort of thing where he's just riding that wave to prosperity. But what happens if it doesn't? What happens if, you know, property values are going up and rents are not going up? Rents are not keeping pace with inflation. Or maybe they even go down. Or maybe they only go down after he starts acquiring them. So this is the problem with trying to model things with fixed rates of return. And so today I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And so what I did is I, go, I went ahead and I'm going to show you just some of the extra rules that I added and what my assumptions were for those. So if you watch last week's class, what I basically did is I took the scenario we ran for Peter where he was saving 20% down to buy these rental properties in order to achieve financial independence. All of those assumptions are exactly the same as this week's, except I added additional things. And so I'm going to tell you what I added. Number one. Uh, let me just open these in new windows and you shall see. All right. So number one, I added variability to stock market. So before it was 8% per year. Now I'm saying, hey, it's somewhere between negative 44.33% per year and high of 65.47. James, where did you get those numbers from? They seem crazy. Really? Negative 44% in a year? Uh-huh. Positive 65% in a year? Uh-huh. And that's based on the Bogleheads actual data for the uh, stock market index fund, VTSMX. And I believe I used like almost 100 years of data to go back and I looked at what was the low, the lowest yearly return we saw, what was the highest yearly return we saw. And then I went and I said, what was the standard deviation from the mean? And it turned out it was 18.3. And then I said that we're going to look at that as if we could get any random return because the stock market is not guaranteed to do what it did in the past. It's possible that it's going to look similar in some ways. The, there's a great quote. I think it's by the, uh, oh man, what's that author's name? The quote is something like, the past doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so we might see similar things happen in the stock market, but we're not going to see the exact same patterns. And so what I says. Let's go ahead and run a scenario where it's random. And so you can see right here, the average 
is 11.13. But it could be as low as negative 44, or it could be as high as positive 66, or whatever it is, 65. Okay? So you can see the range of values. And so the stock market's going to be variable. And so if I go look at this scenario here, let's go ahead and go to scenarios. And we'll pull up a chart of the yearly rate of return. Oops, nope, hit the wrong button. Yearly rate of return. So this shows you the rate of return in the stock market. It's variable. Where before it was fixed at 8%, okay? All right, so I did that one. That one means that the stock market is somewhere between those ranges and it's variable. There could be years where he does really well. There could be years where he does not so well. Then I said, rent is not going up automatically at 2% per year. It's variable as well. And so that ranges, and, and by the way, this is somewhat arbitrary. You know, just because a market hasn't seen a negative 10% decline in rents in a particular year doesn't mean it won't. And just because we haven't seen a rent go up as much as 14% a year doesn't mean it won't. But overall, on average, we're saying it's going up about 2% a year. It's keeping pace with inflation on average, but it can be as low as negative 10 a year or positive 14 an interesting thing about rents is that rents, according to how we model it, don't change mid-lease. It only changes once we get to the end of the lease and then it adjusts from there. So we kind of like keep track internally of what rents are really doing in the marketplace. But then when the lease renews, we renew it whatever the then current market rent is, okay, based on that. And so you can see the distribution. On average, it's going up about 2% a year, but there are years where rents go down and there are years where rents go up. Very similarly, I set a rule to say property values are also doing that. Again, negative 10 to positive 14, and that they're going up 2%. And is there anyone on from Denver today? I know last week we had someone on from Denver today, and I talked about using a 2% appreciation rate, and they thought I was crazy. They're like 2%. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, someone raised their hand. Christy, I think it may have been you last week that was on. So, you know, basically, I, I said 2% per year appreciation rate, and they were laughing. Chris is also from Denver. And, and they were like laughing. They're like, yeah, 2%. Yeah, maybe per month, something like that, right? Something crazy. But is it possible that we will see a slowdown in appreciation in Denver? Sure. Is it possible that it'll keep up and continue to do 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% per year? Sure. And could you model this differently if you wanted to? Absolutely. I use these assumptions because I wanted to make it what I consider to be relatively conservative, okay? So we use the same thing. It's averaging about 2%. And if we ran this again, you could see this number would change. 2.07, because it's doing like 50, uh, 5,000 test points to kind of get you some, some data points there. 2.04, so it's showing you the average of what they are, okay? So that's about what rent and property values are appreciating at. And then finally, I did mortgage interest rates. Mortgage interest rates, when I put them in there last week, I used a fixed one. I, I think I, I looked them up online before I did the class, but it was something ridiculously low, like 2.625 for an owner-occupant interest rate. It was like 2. I don't know, 2.875 or something like that for 25% down. And maybe it was just over three for 20% down. It was, it was real numbers. I actually went and looked them up. But now I'm saying, we're going to start at this number here for the interest rates. And I'm gonna say the, the lowest they could possibly ever go for an investor buying a property with 20% down, I set the bottom at 2.5, that's the minimum. But we've seen interest rates as high as 18 in the 80s. So I used 18 as the high. But what I did is I said, this one doesn't go random. It's not like one month it's gonna be 2.5 and then the next month it's gonna be 11. Instead of doing a huge range like that, I said, okay, it can go up or down by as much as 0.5 or negative 0.5. And so you can see this is the amount it can change each month. And then it usually changes about um, as little as 0.375 and can change that way, okay? So you can see the range of values as we do this. Okay, so the interest rates are going to snake along. Sometimes they'll be up a little bit, sometimes they'll be down, sometimes they'll be up a lot, sometimes they'll be down a lot, but they can never go below 2.5 and they can go as high as 18 if they happen to get there, which we don't know if they will or not, okay. So that's how I changed the rules. What does that mean for Peter? Well, let's let's review quickly what he did last week. This is the 20% down one. So Peter last week 
when he did this, his ability to retire early, when he reached financial independence, where the income from his rental properties, after all the expenses on them, and any money he's earning from money had in the stock market, assuming a 4% safe withdrawal rate, which is what our assumptions were, when does he get to the point where he's able to hit financial independence and retire? And we looked at this chart, and when this line crosses the dotted, when this kind of like dark area crosses this red dotted line, that's when he has enough money coming in from his rental properties and from using a safe withdrawal rate from the stock market so that he has enough money to live off passive income. Okay, that's the crossing point when he reaches 100% of his goal. Anything more than this, he's got a surplus. Anything less than this, he doesn't quite have enough to fully fund his living expenses in retirement. Turns out that was in month 352. So it took him just over 29 years in order to do this, assuming 8% fixed rate return in the stock market, a 2% appreciation rate, 2% rent appreciation rate, and interest rates remain low for his entire time buying properties. So what does that look like when we compare it to him doing this 20% down, but we add some variability. So it turned out when he does it and he has some variability, it took him 37 years in this case to do it. 37 years versus 29 years. So it took him another eight years in order to do that. However, if we go ahead and rerun this thing again, because it's variable, because whatever the stock market does, can change and whatever the rent appreciation and home price appreciation, all those things can change. What does it actually look like if we run it again? Because each time we run it, it's slightly different. So now it only took 33 years, only a little bit more than four years longer to do that, okay? And each time we run this, it's going to be different. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a couple copies. I'll make five copies of this and just show you. A bunch of these different examples and show you the range of them. Because I can. All right. So as this does those, we'll go ahead and Save them. And then now on here, you'll see I've got a bunch of different copies. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to chart one, but then I'm going to add in another copy. And I'll add in another copy. And I'll add in another copy. And I'll add in another copy. And I'm going to add in one last one. Okay. So now these show you the range of values we have for all these. And I'll kind of just do them as lines to make it easier to see. But you can see now for net worth, you know, his best case, just running five of these in a row, his best case by the time he gets to retirement is like $47 million, almost $48 million. His worst case was $22 million. If we go and we look at how fast he can get to retirement, we can now see a range of these. And we could see that. His best case was 316 months. His worst case was 480, 488 months. So there was one case that was better than the time we ran it where the things were fixed. So this is what's, this is what's so fascinating to me is that Peter's thinking to himself, you know, depending on what happens in the market, I could start this strategy and things could not go my way. And it would take a lot longer for me to get to financial independence. Or things could very well go my way, and this could be faster. And so what is the likelihood? What's the probability that I'll be able to get to the point where I'll be able to hit financial independence with these things being variable? And so Peter says, I want to know that. And so you could go and sort of like make copies of each one of these things and run them a whole bunch of times in order to find out, you know, what's the best case that I've seen? What's the worst case that I've seen? Or what I have is the ability to run them all in aggregate and have it kind of like give you a visual summary of what's happening here. And so if you look at this, you can see there's a range of these lines. I'll just, I'll zoom in a little bit, make it easier to see. There's a range of these lines. There's one here where it's like really early. There's one where it's really late. And there's a whole bunch in the middle where it's kind of clustered together. And it's random. If I ran this again, they would all be different again. Okay. 
So this shows you the range of when he's able to achieve his goal. We could look at this similar chart for everything. We can look at you know, how quickly he buys houses as an example. So number of properties owned. And we can see that in some cases, he's able to buy the houses sooner. These are the lines that are kind of more to the left. And then sometimes it takes a lot longer like this green line in order to be able to buy houses. And so you can see there's a range of where these values are. Same thing with cash flow. You know, some properties are gonna have better cash flow. And so some properties are gonna have improved cash flow for him and some are gonna be worse. And so we can look at that. We can look at anything, bank account balance, um, you know, how fast he's paying down debts. All of this stuff can be looked at. So instead of doing that though, what I did is I took the same scenario we did before and I actually ran it a hundred times. And then I summarized what's happening in those 100 times. And so I'm gonna go and show you a couple interesting charts that I think are interesting. Let's see here, let's go to the goal. All right, so this is showing you how quickly he's achieving his goal of financial independence. And I know there's a lot going on here. I know it looks really busy and you're like, James, what am I even looking at? It looks like this big blue blob of something. But Peter wants to know, you know, what are his chances of this working out for him? And what are these chances of it not working out for him? And this chart shows you that, okay? If you look at, it's hard with the mouse over. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit too. Okay. So on here, you can see there's these really light lines kind of right here. That shows you the best case scenario. Basically the top 1%, and since we only ran it hundred times, the top one run that he did. That's his like, if everything went his way, that's the best he could consider of these 100 runs. The really light line over here where he doesn't make, he basically has no money toward retirement because it all went against him. That's the case where he didn't do well at all. Okay, so that's like the worst case scenario. And the other one on this left side is the best case. As the, as the gray stuff gets shaded in, those mark off like percentages. So you can think of it as, you know, the, the middle most group is the one that happens X percent of the time. So a, a, another way to think about this is this. I'll, uh, I'm going to show it a different way. This chart uh, below here shows you how many of the 100 times we ran this did he actually hit his goal of having enough money to retire? And so you can see early on that only one of the 100 runs meant that, meant that he could see retirement. And then a couple of times here, it zooms in. A couple of times it jumps up to 2%, but then it falls back down. So there's not a lot of cases in the first 300 or so months where he's actually been able to achieve financial independence with this strategy. And this is, by the way, this is very specifically the strategy of him saving up 20% down payments and buying rental properties, not moving into any of them. And this also takes into account that uh, prices on houses are going up or going down. Rents are going up or going down. Um, the stock market is going up or going down. And that uh, mortgage interest rates are also variable. They can go up or down too. So all of those things are coming into play. And so sometimes rents and prices are going up at the same time. Sometimes they're going in opposite directions. Sometimes the stock market's going up with him or not, or not with him. And we could go ahead if we wanted to, and maybe we will in future classes, we could say, hey, listen, I think the market's going to be stable for the next three years, four years, five years, 10 years, whatever it is. But after that, I really don't know. And we could go in there and say, okay, for the next 10 years, we're going to run it as, you know, we're seeing 5% appreciation on average. It could be anywhere from zero to 10 with a 5% average in there and have it run like that. And then after that, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe we have a huge decline where markets drop 10% or 20%. And then we could see how a strategy we're running, whatever strategy you happen to be running at the time, in this case, he's buying 20% down properties, we could see how that would perform. And will that be a better strategy for you than another strategy? For example, and I didn't do this today, but I should do it. We should compare how risky Peter doing this strategy of buying 20% down properties is compared to how risky it would have been for him doing 5% down properties. Because that may make a big difference. It might be a huge difference. Or same thing with 25% down. It might be better for him to have saved up running this 100 times with some variability than it would be for him to do it once. And that's what's interesting about it. 
And I probably will do, do those in the future. But this shows you, to get back to the chart, this shows you the number of times out of 100 that he was able to achieve financial independence. And so by like month 360, 30 years in the future, only 28% or 28 out of 100 times was he able to achieve financial independence with this strategy. Does anyone remember, what was the what was the year? We'll go look at the year for the fixed one. So this was the variable ones. This was 20% down. Let's find out what year he was able to achieve financial independence. And we'll look at that year and see like what percentage of them happened then. So it was month 352. So month 352, when we, when we did it before and all of our numbers were static, we had a, uh, we, we, he was able to achieve financial independence. Now, now that all the things are variable, he only achieves financial independence, uh, financial independence 26% of the time when we have variable appreciation, rent appreciation, stock market rate of return, and mortgage interest rate. 26% of the time. Now, some side notes about Peter's situation. Is it possible, and for those of you that have already seen my cash flow versus appreciation class where I had cash flow Brian competing against appreciation James and we went to like freaky town with this, this idea. Is it possible that he's able to do some creative things like sell off properties to pay off other ones or um, you know, convert like buy more properties than he needs and then sell off some of them in order to have some more free and clear properties and do stuff like that with the equity or cash out refinances or things like that. Is it possible that he could do things like that in order to still achieve financial independence? Sure. And we'll probably cover those in additional story times. But right now, we only assume he's just buying properties and he's trying to get to that elusive financial independence from cash flow on the properties and any money as a stock market. And we just showed that doing it with variable returns, it's only 26% of the time is he actually successful hitting financial independence. Whereas if we used our static assumptions, it was like, that was what we said the number was. Not true. So where does it get to the point where it's 100% of the time? Turns out it never does. You know, we've modeled this for 60 years and he only has a 95% chance of achieving financial independence doing this particular strategy. Now, 95% is pretty good. But what if you're that one time out of 20? That's what 95% means, by the way. One time out of 20 that you are not able to achieve financial independence using this strategy. That's kind of scary. And that's 60 years later. If he's 25, he's 85. And he still hasn't hit it. So this is why we need to kind of pay attention to these things. You can see though that, you know, there are times when I don't know, right around here, it's about 60% of the runs are able to achieve financial independence, okay? Now, in a lot of these cases, he actually has cash. Let's take a look at some of this. Here's his total account balances. And so in a lot of these cases, he has money in the bank. In fact, if you mouse over here, you can see the range of values. And so it shows you on the top line here, Peter from Denver buys 10, 20% down payment rentals, the one percentile to the 99th percentile, one out of a hundred times, he has negative money. He ran out of money in this, in this case, he's $162,000 short, but in the best case scenario, he's $16 million to the positive. In the range of 5% to 95% or one time out of 20, he's made, uh, he has $22,000 in his bank account. And one time out of 20, he has $13.6 million in his bank account. The 10th percentile and 90th percentile, one out of 10 times, he has less than $617,000. And one time out of 10, he has more than $12 million in the bank. The 25th to 75th percentile, that means that one time out of four, he has less than $1.6 million or one time out of four, he has more than $9.2 million. And so it shows you the range of values that he has in the bank account. So he could, in theory, take some of his money, use it to pay off the properties and probably still achieve financial dependence in some cases, not in all of them. And we can add rules to actually do this so that we could see if that improves his ability to achieve financial dependence and get to the end safely and successfully, but not all the time, okay? And then we could compare 
this strategy of not doing those extra things to strategies where he does do extra things like paying off properties or buying more than he needs or refinancing as he needs money or things of that nature. Okay, so you can see a range of those things doing that. This shows you his range of cash flow. So you can go in here and see like what the cash flow looks like for him. But there are times you can see that there's times when it goes below zero, that he actually has negative cash flow on his properties. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, that's what happens when rents don't always go up and you buy properties. You can have point properties that you have negative cash flow on. This is his measure of debt and it shows you the range it's a measure of risk. It measures his total debt to his net worth. And you could see there's a range of how risky the strategy is. And we could use this to compare other strategies he's doing to see how his risk is. But his risk is highest when he buys that first property and then it goes down and then he buys a second. And then each additional property he buys adds a little bit of extra risk, but it gets smoothed out over time. Okay. This is the amount he invested in his rentals, including any negative cash flow, which I'm not going to cover right now. And then here's an interesting one. It tells you how much equity he has if he sold his properties with a real estate agent. And so you can see he doesn't have very much equity early on, but over time, the amount of equity goes up and it increases. There are some cases where he doesn't have very much equity at all. And there are some cases where he has tons of equity and that's what's going on. And then here's the one if he does cash out refinance. If he wants to see how much cash out refinance equity he has in those 100 runs, he could do that. And then I think I'm going to end it pretty close to here unless people have questions, but this chart shows you how quickly or how slowly he's buying properties. And so it's just that same chart before where we did, let's see, I'll show you the, the, the single version of this. Actually, is it this one? No, it's not. So uh, the single version where we're saying number of properties owned. So remember before, I'm going to zoom back to normal. So right here, it shows you like how quickly he buys properties. If we add in one of the random ones we did before, you could see that they kind of vary. Sometimes he's able to buy them faster. Sometimes it takes them a little bit longer. This chart summarizes all of those and shows you how quickly or how slowly they're buying properties. And it shows you the average line or you know what the average of all of them are together or the middlemost line where he is actually saying, okay, half of the... Half of the time he's able to do it faster than this. And half of the time he's able to do it slower than this. And it shows you those as well with the dark lines in the middle. But it gives you an idea of what the range is. There are times when he's able to acquire all 10 of his properties or so as quickly as right here, 258 months. And there are times when he never is able to acquire all 10 of his properties. It takes him longer than 720 months in order to do that. And you can see the range here. But most of the time, on average, he's doing it right around here, which is about 360 months. That's when he's acquiring on average his 10 properties. Okay. Any questions on his, oh, this is months of reserves. This is actually pretty interesting. Maybe I'll show you this too. Zoom in, shows you how many months of reserves he has as he's acquiring his properties. Sometimes he's, he's got good reserves. Sometimes he doesn't because sometimes the market's going against him. Sometimes he's not. And then each one of these big lines down is when he acquires a property and he spends his money that he normally had set aside for reserves to do that. Okay. Okay. Any questions on Peter's situation? What I wanted you to take away from this is the markets can go in his favor and the markets can go against him. And you can now see the range of what is his likelihood of being able to hit this financial independence number based on his strategy. It's not automatically that one number we named before. It's not like you can say, oh, 29 years and I'm done. Maybe, maybe it's actually only 25 years. Maybe it's 37 years. And you need to look at this stuff and say, what are my odds of getting to the place where I need to be to be able to hit my own retirement numbers if you're running these yourself? Okay. Any questions? Wow, you guys are really quiet this morning. Like no one's asking any questions. Usually I get a whole bunch of crazy questions and stuff. Everyone's all shy and I don't know, maybe it was the game yesterday. Maybe people didn't like the football game. All right. If you have no questions, that's all I got for you. I wanted to share with you this range of stuff. And then now that you know how this works, we can now compare different strategies to other strategies. So I might go back 
maybe for next week, hint, hint, that I might go back and run the same variability for 25% down and the same variability for 5% down. And now we'll see which one of those is most likely to be successful and most likely to achieve his financial independence goal. And we can take a look at where is the odds most in his favor? Because you may find out that 5% is way better, or we may find out that 5% is way worse, or 25% down is way better, or 25% down is way worse than 20%. And then we could add some additional things in there in order to make him more likely to be successful by doing some more aggressive or more active sort of investing strategies. All right, I gave you your chance. If there are no questions, I am going to end the call. Thank you all for joining us. Hope you have enjoyed another episode of Storytime with Peter. And there really are no questions. That's very sad. Oh, got a question. There we go. I think this is the most comprehensive investment simulation I've seen. Thank you. (laughs) Oh my gosh, Chris. Oh my gosh. All right. So I I will, I will admit something to you. (laughs) You're very welcome, Eric. I will admit something to you, Chris. This is basic for me. (laughs) This is like me sort of like uh, baby stepping it out to you. Like I'm, I'm just trying to give you the, the basics so that we can go to freaky town. Because there is so much more stuff coming. (laughs) You have no idea. So if this is the most comprehensive one you've seen, then brace yourselves because there is just a ridiculous amount of craziness coming on. So that's awesome. I'm glad you thought it was most comprehensive because uh, you're very welcome, Candice. Yeah, I I mean, this is going to be one of those things where uh, you're like, holy crap. And, And what's crazy is being able to compare like two uh, Monte Carlo. What we're really doing is Monte Carlo, right? So I can go ahead and add. Um, let's see. Let's do this one. We can add two Monte Carlo uh, to the things, and we can compare them on top of each other. So you can actually see two different Monte Carlo scenarios. So I, I did one where I ran it a hundred times, and I did one where I ran it a thousand times. Same exact scenario. And the red curve is the smoother one. That's the one with a thousand runs. And this one's only run with a hundred runs. It just takes so long to do the thousand runs. that I, I didn't have time to do it for the class. So I did the one with a hundred and you could see how, how the smooth gets curved, how the curve gets smoothed out. And we could do it comparing it to a whole bunch of other totally different strategies. Like, should you burr? Should you go ahead and house hack? Should you invest in other cities? Should you uh, buy properties and sell? Should you do rate and term refinances if interest rates drop below certain things? Can you do all these other things? And so what does that mean? So there's all sorts of crazy stuff coming, but I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, Shanti says, OMG, I'm bracing myself. That's exactly right. Brace yourself for all all the craziness. So, all right, folks, uh, that is all I have for you for today then. And I hope you're enjoying story time and uh, hopefully we'll do some more. I'm wondering... You know, I'm I'm constantly thinking about these things. I'm wondering if I do less videos and more blog posts. So I was uh I was hot tubbing it the other day last night with Tammy, and we were discussing writing out blog posts, publishing content that way instead of doing videos. So I don't know. I might play around with that too. See how this goes, but it could be good. The nice thing about the uh, the blog post is I can cross reference and link to things so that if you want to go down a rabbit hole with whatever burr, you can just say, oh, what's all the other burr things James has done? Or what's the other, you know, the house hacking ones that he's done? Or what about ones where he pays off properties early? And then you can enter the link between all this stuff and see, and I don't have to keep repeating myself and explaining all the, the setup. I can just use it once. And so it's good. A shot they says, is it greedy or selfish to want both? I love story time. Um, it's probably not. It's probably appropriate, but yeah. I don't know. It's just, yeah. There's some time and effort and prep that goes into it. So, all right. Hey, do you think, I've got some feedback for the people that are still on. I know we've had some people drop off because they heard me say we're ending it like 10 times. Uh, but of the people still on here, do you think you'd want to have these available as part of the podcast so that you could listen to them as you drive? I know you can't see the visuals and that's part of the challenge, but you'll be at least listen to them in your car. Is there anyone who thinks they'd want those? By the way, uh, CC, you're very welcome. Uh, anything, anyone want those? I think you need to see these. Yeah. 
Toby says, thanks, James. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I think you probably do need to see him. It is sort of tricky. All right. On that note, guys, I'm going to go grab myself breakfast. Thank you all for coming on. Thank you all for attending store time and seeing this journey with Peter. I will talk to you all soon. Have a great day. Bye for now.